This is going to be episode number nine of God's Game of Thrones. Before you were introduced to King Noah, you were introduced to a place that men would have you believe is a fantasy world. Not only do you have 900-year-olds running around during the days of Noah, but also angels walking on earth and giants. Not only do you have intense violence, but also sex perversion and everything else that's wicked. And Lucifer, the former king of both kingdoms, is, is still up to his old tricks. Remember how the Lord told him back in Genesis 3.15? He said, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now the devil what doesn't want his head bruised. So ever since he heard that, he was trying to corrupt the seed. He tried right away when he moved Cain to Myrtle murder Abel because the seed would come through Abel now he's going to try to corrupt the seed again in chapter 6 of Genesis and in this study I'm going to introduce you again to the sons of God which are angels and we will also discuss the objections to the teaching because a lot of people really hate this teaching and they'll go out of their way to not believe it for one reason is it's so unbelievable and crazy but it says in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. The common teaching is that the sons of God, in the verses here, are actually the godly line of Seth. And that the daughters of men are simply children of Lost people. So they teach what you have here is saved men marrying lost women. And as a practical application, you could use these verses to teach against marrying an unbeliever. But that's not what this is about. Here are some reasons why I believe these sons of God here in Genesis 6 are angels marrying human women. And it sounds crazy. But just hear me out. I mean, there's a lot of crazy things that go on in the book of Genesis. Okay, the first reason. You have giants in the context of sons of God and daughters of men, plainly showing the giants came through this ungodly relationship. Number two, a distinction is made. Sons of God and daughters of men. Why is there a distinction? Number three, if the sons of God are saved people and daughters of men are lost people, then why would it only be saved boys marrying lost girls? Also, if the sons of God is the godly line of Seth, and the daughters of men are the daughters of Cain, since, w since when does your family determine if you're a saint or a child of the devil? Some men from bad families are right with God, and some men from godly families are not right with God. Number five, why would an intermarriage between saved men and lost women produce giants? Number six, if the sons of God are a godly line, then why didn't they get on the ark? Why did they choose not to get on the ark? Because 2 Peter 2, 5 says the flood was brought upon the world of the ungodly. It looks like these sons of God took the women against their will. Why would it be these saved men taking the lost women against their will? Why is it the sons of God supposedly save people influencing the sin? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Notice it says they took them wives. The sons of God took them wives. And if you search that phrase, it would take you to verses like Judges twenty one twenty three. It says, And the children of Benjamin did so and took them wives according to their number of them that danced, whom they caught. So, this is me speculating, but it seems they were taken against their will, the daughters of men. They took them wives. 
And Genesis 6, 2 said, The sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. Angels seem to be enticed by human women. 1 Corinthians 11, 8 through 10 says, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Why does it say that? Why does it say the woman ought to have power on her head because of the angels? And it says the woman was created for the man. It doesn't say she was created for the angels. It is also possible, but this is speculation, that men tempted the angels with the women. For what reason? Maybe to get some extra knowledge from somewhere. Men are always wanting to get extra knowledge. Men are always trying to get a hold of the spirit world, even to this day, to get extra knowledge, advanced technology, things like that. Another possibility is that the women didn't even realize the men were angels because some have entertained angels unawares, according to Hebrews 13, 2. Another thing, it says in Genesis 6, 3, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Why does it say also? There seems to be other beings accounted for besides man. The next one, many teach that since Israel is called sons and daughters, that this has to be God's people called sons of God in Genesis 6. The nation of Israel as a nation is, is called sons of daughters in Isaiah 44, 23, but there is no national distinction yet in Genesis 6. That doesn't come until later. Abraham is the first Jew and he hasn't even been born yet. Genesis 6, 4. So there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. So notice the phrase, also after that. This shows it happened again at a later date. And you also see that in the Bible. You see giants showing up later in the Bible. Many men will take you to Hebrews 1.5 to prove that angels can't be called sons of God. Hebrews 1.5 says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So they say, see, he never said to an angel at any time, thou art my son. However, they have to ignore the next few words. They have to ignore the phrase, this day have I begotten thee. The, the Lord never did say, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, to an angel. Because angels are sons of God, but they aren't begotten sons. And they certainly aren't the only begotten son of God, like Jesus Christ is. And they aren't adopted sons of God like we are. So they're sons, but they're not begotten sons. To use Hebrews 1.5 to prove angels can't be called sons, you got to overlook part of the verse. Then in Luke 20, 34 through 36, it talks about how saints are equal unto the angels and calls us children of God, showing that they would also be children. And a lot of men will use Matthew twenty two thirty to teach that angels are sexless. However, it doesn't say that they're sexless. In Matthew twenty two thirty, it says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So it doesn't say they're sexless. It says that the angels of God in heaven don't, don't marry. And they definitely don't marry among themselves because they're all male. Every time an angel shows up in the Bible, it calls them a man, a young man, the young men. And the book of Jude talks about the angels which kept not their first estate. These would be the ones who left God because they were enticed by human women. And the book of Mark makes it even more clear. In the gospel of Mark and chapter 12 25 it says for when they shall rise from the dead neither they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels which are in heaven so the ones the angels that don't marry are the angels which are presently in heaven and luke sheds even more light when you read luke's account it plainly shows that these verses can't can't be speaking of every angel 
In Luke 20, 35 through 36, it says, But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain the world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Notice it says, Neither can they die any more. This teaches that in our resurrection bodies we are like the angels and can't die. However, the angels who don't die are the ones who don't rebel against the Lord. There are angels that do die that rebel against the Lord. And that's pretty plain in the Bible because in 2 Peter 2, 4 it says, First God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So if they are in hell, then these angels will eventually go to the lake of fire which is the second death. Revelation 20, 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So these sons of God left the Lord for their lusts and forfeited their immortality. Psalms 82, 6 and 7 says, I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but... Ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Die like men. Why would it say die like men if it wasn't men? It's talking about the angels. He calls them gods, little g, and he calls them children. It's those sons of God. Now, look at the earth and how it was during the time of Noah when angels and giants walked the earth, when violence and sex perversion were rampant in the earth. In Genesis 6, 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now look at this next verse. A verse you just overlook. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Notice that Noah was perfect in his generations. The sons of God, which are fallen angels, mating with human women was another way, an attempt by the devil, Lucifer, the former king of both kingdoms, to corrupt the line of the promised seed. Noah's line was the only one that hadn't been corrupted. He was perfect in his generations. And him and his family would have to carry on that promised seed. That's the theme. If you're looking for Jesus Christ in the book of Genesis, that's the theme, is Jesus as the promised seed. And you'll find the devil trying to corrupt that seed. And that's what he does with the sons of God and the daughters of men. But Noah would carry on the seed. Noah and his boys, they carry on the seed. They're perfect in their generations. They haven't been corrupted by that, that the fallen angels. Now, if you're still not convinced that the sons of God are angels and you still think that they're people, saved people, let me show you some more verses. Um, it, I mean, it's very hard to teach that it's, it's human men because of all these verses here. And I would rather be right and teach the Bible as it says it than to than, and look stupid and people think I'm crazy and to teach it the way everybody else teaches it, and people think, well, yeah, he's not crazy. But in Job 1, 6 through 7, we're going to see the sons of God. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Notice that the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. 
So my first question to you is, if you believe that the sons of God are saved men in the Old Testament, why are the sons of God hanging around the devil and why are they in the third heaven? Why would these sons of God in the Old Testament, if they're saved people, why would they be in the third heaven? Do you not believe that the Old Testament saints went to the heart of the earth in the Old Testament? The average Bible believer believes that when the Old Testament saints died, they went to the heart of the earth. They did not go to the third heaven. So what were these people doing if it was saved people, if sons of God are saved people, why are they able to present themselves before the Lord in the third heaven with the devil? That's my first question to you. Now, I understand that there's people who who believe that the Old Testament saints went to the third heaven. So, that'll be their answer. But what about you? You believe that the Old Testament saints went to the heart of the earth, which that's what I believe. So, I don't believe that they're going to be in the third heaven and in the heart of the earth at the same time. But that's what you'd have to teach if you believe the sons of God are saved people. And then Second Chronicles 18.18 18 says, Again he said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. So it shows spirits standing around the throne, not saints. So if sons of God are simply saved people, then why does Job 38 have them here alive? When God laid the foundations of the earth, which happened before Adam was even create, created. Job 38, 4 through 7. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So there you see the sons of God or here when God laid the foundations of the earth and this was before Adam and Eve. So how could the sons of God be the God that Seth or saved men if man hasn't even been created yet? That's my question to you. So notice also in verses like 2 Peter 4, it has angels sinning in context with Noah's flood, linking angels sinning to Genesis 6. In 2 Peter 2, 4 through 5, it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Once again, if the sons of God are the godly line of Seth or saved people, then why didn't they get on the ark? Why does it say they would have perished in the flood upon the world of the ungodly? The Bible plainly says the people that died in the flood were ungodly. So how would they be a godly line of Seth? Why didn't they get on the ark? Also notice in Jude, it links angel sinning with Sodom and Gomorrah, a place known for sexual perversion. Also, a people going after strange flesh, just like the angels would have done with the daughters of men. In Jude 6 through 7, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. And going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So we, so as we have seen the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bare children unto them, this produced giants. A key thing is that these, or that there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. So let's look at giants after that. So you see that Israel saw the giants. Joshua, Caleb, and Moses all saw the giants. They fought giants. There were lands of giants. In Deuteronomy 3.13, it says, And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, 
gave out unto the half tribe of Manasseh all the region of Argob with all Bashan, which was called the land of the giant, land of giants. So imagine being Moses and Joshua and having to go fight these lands of giants. In Deuteronomy 9, verse 1, it says, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go and to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself. Cities great and fenced up to heaven, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? So the fact that Israel was able to defeat them doesn't prove Israel is strong. It proves God is strong. The giants were greater and taller. A nation much mightier. However, God is greater and taller than the giants. God used the weaker people to defeat the strong people so that he could get the glory. And it says, Understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. As a consuming fire he shall destroy them. And he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quick, quickly. As the Lord hath said unto thee, Speak not thou in thine heart. After that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee, not for thy righteousness, or for the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So also notice it isn't because Israel was good and righteous that God was going to allow them to go in and possess the land, but because of the wickedness of the nations. The giants were wicked, and they practiced all kinds of abominations. I mean, witchcraft, sorcery, wizards, child sacrifice, all of it. They did all of those abominations. And another bad thing about the giants is the giants lived a very long time. They had uh, the... Ages like the people did in, in the early book, in the early part of the book of Genesis. You know, Noah was living to be 900. Seth to be lived very old. And you know, they lived so long that uh, Seth was still here when Abraham was alive. And the giants themselves lived a very long time. Notice that these giants that it was talking about are the Anakims. They are the children of Anak. The father of Anak, named Arba, was around during Abraham's day. That's how long he these people lived. In Joshua fifteen thirteen, it says, And unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which, is, which city is Hebron. Okay, so he got the city... The city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. So Arba was the father of Anak, and Arba was alive around the time of Abraham, and Anak was alive during the time of Joshua. So Genesis 23, 2 says, And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So there were giants in Abraham's day, and specifically one named Arba, who had a son named Anak, who was alive during the time of Joshua. So these giants were living really long lifespans. So it seems they had long lifespans like the men that were on the earth during the book of Genesis. However, they also degenerated over time. Because at first you had angels mating with human women, making these beings these giants but then it's just giants with other giants or giants with human women so you see a degeneration of the giants look at deuteronomy 311 says for only og king of bashan remained of the remnant of giants behold his bedstead was a bedstead of iron is it not in Raboth of the children of Ammon. Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth thereof after the cubit of a man. So you can see Og's height was over 12 feet tall. 
Then Goliath came 450 years later, and Goliath is only nine and a half feet tall. That's a pretty big difference. 1 Samuel 17, 4 says, And there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So he's about nine and a half feet tall. Also notice that David, when he comes to the giant, he's got one staff when he approaches Goliath. Yet Goliath thought he had more than one. Was he cross-eyed? Did he have some deformities? In 1 Samuel 17, 43, it says, And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So David just had one staff. Goliath thought he had more than one. Also, the fact that Goliath was dumb enough to get killed by a rock shows that these later giants weren't too bright, and the Lord knew that. So the Lord uses something little to take down something big once again. And that wasn't the only running with giants that David had. In 2 Samuel 21, 16, it says, In Ishbi Binab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass and weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. So this guy... Ishbi Binab, he is still probably not as big as the original giants, but still very big. He almost slew David, the reigning champ. The guy's spear weighed 300 shekels of brass, and the devil would have loved to slay King David with a giant. But he didn't. And also notice that this Ishbi Binab was girded with a new sword, and he almost slew David in his old age. This should remind you to stick with the old way. Don't let a new sword like the NIV or the RSV or the NKJV and all that stuff steal away your heart for the old book. Don't let someone come upon you with a new sword. But David didn't die that day. Because it says, but Abisha, the son of Zeruiah, succored him. And smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachiah the Hushathite slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jer Eorgim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature, that on, had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he was also born to the giant. So this giant has six fingers and six toes. So these newer classes of giants are smaller with deformities, and this could be because the original giants came from angels mating with women. The later generation came from giants mating with women. So these stories are about small people beating up big people. Not because they're strong, but because God is strong. And when the odds are against, the, against you, then you must rely on the Lord and take down the big things the devil throws your way. The big things run upon you, just like Job says in Job 16, 14. He breaketh me with breach upon breach. He runneth upon me like a giant. The giants even have names in the Bible. Some of the names are Og, Anak, Goliath, Ishbibinob, Saph. You know, the, the giants are named. They lived among people. And I'm sure you know the name of your giant in your life. And you got to realize that you're not the only person facing that giant. There's millions of people everywhere going through the same thing that you're doing. Tons of Christians going through the same thing that you're going through. But just like these people, God's people in the Old Testament, they beat up these giants. You can beat up your giant. 
but it's going to take the Lord because they're stronger than you. But this has been episode nine of God's Game of Thrones. And you see how the devil is still bitter. He's still trying to corrupt the seed. And that's why he caused the sons of God and the daughters of men relationship to take place. And it produced giants. And you don't have to believe what I've taught today, but I hope you'll look over all the scripture that I've given you and see that a lot of the arguments people give against this are just people trying their hardest to find something to make it not be true. And the arguments they give just don't hold any weight compared to the ones that I just gave. I mean, if you've got something to show me to show that I'm wrong on this, I want to be right, just show it to me. And I'll, I'll go over it and I'll, I'll see if the Bible teaches that I'm wrong or not. Just like you need to have an open heart and an open mind. Don't let men determine what you're going to believe. Let God determine what you're going to believe. Okay, say that you've believed that the sons of God are saved men for the past 40 years. If you find out today that they're not saved men, then change your belief on it. You don't have to keep believing the same thing just because that's what you've always believed. Adjust your beliefs to fit the Bible. Don't adjust the Bible to fit your beliefs. Don't feel like you have to believe what all the old great men of God, as they say, taught. Because they were wrong on some things too. But I hope you'll study over these verses and come out believing like the Bible teaches.